as your fly is coming down, my mate yanks that teaser out of the water and your fly lands. The fish sees it. You pop it once and he turns and he eats it and takes off jumping. It's all within 25 feet of the boat. So you've got like a front row seat looking straight at it. Crystal clear, beautiful water that's, you know, er everything's in the, in the high 80s, the air temperature and water temperature. And, and these fish are, you know, they're 10, 12 feet long and they're lit up on beautiful colors and they come out of the water and just go crazy. That was Captain Jake Jordan describing what hooking into a blue marlin on the fly is all about. The number one fly guy for billfish and sailfish today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Have you heard of the new Clubhouse social media app? Uh, not that uh, you need necessarily a new Clubhouse a new app, but uh, I wanted to give you a heads up here. Um, we're starting, uh, we actually have a group, a fly fishing group there. It's in beta right now for iPhone uh, users only, but it's going to be opening up uh, here in the next few months uh, to everyone. So I wanted to give you a heads up on this. You can find me at, uh, at Dave C. Stewart. And if you connect with me or you can send me a dm if you need an invite and i'll help you to get on there um so it'd be great we're going to be doing some live shows and things like that on the air where you can raise your hand get up on stage and uh, ask some questions of our of our guests jake jordan has been a leader in the saltwater fly fishing game for a long long time we find out which billfish is the easiest to get started with uh, and a super easy and amazing trip you can connect with as well. Plus, we find out how to get your first tarpon uh, for around 600 bucks, and maybe even cheaper if you take Jake up on, on his bet. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Ed Ward's vision. The Micro Series uh, from 3 to 5 weight comes exceptionally close to single-handed specs and is proving to be a unique tool for trout and smallmouth anglers. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash O-P-S-T. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, and paddlers from all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. The Sawyer Artisan Oar is their very popular square top oar with carbon fiber X weave fiberglass shaft reinforcement, featuring prints of fish species from artists around the country, passionate about fisheries and fishing art. These oars showcase Sawyer's and the artist's ability to create rugged yet highly functional art. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, to get started right now. Uh, we walked through it all today, step by step. So uh, without further ado, here is Jake Jordan. Uh, how's it going, Jake? Pretty good. How are you, sir? Good, good. Thanks for taking the time to put this together. Um We've got a bunch to talk about here. I'm hoping to dig into uh, some of your background and, and maybe some tips and tricks on bill billfish and fishing for them out there. Um, but before we get to all that, uh, I know you've got a long background. Maybe just kind of briefly go through your history of how you first got into fly fishing and kind of how you brought it to where you are now. Sure. I'll be glad to. I, uh, I, I was born and raised in southern New Jersey. My dad had a marina. I grew up fishing and working on fishing boats, either uh, sport fishing boats or, or commercial fishing boats, charter boats. And, uh, and my dad was a, was, a, was a saltwater fly fisherman back in the, you know, I'm going, I'm talking about during world war two. And uh, he, uh, he, they had a, a club in New Jersey. It was called the, the, uh, I can't remember his saltwater fly fishers or something that he, belong to they used to meet in wildwood new jersey and i remember going there when i was a little kid and, you know meeting some important people uh I, I i just loved it and then as i grew up i went off i went to military and when i came out of military i was uh, 
I went back to New Jersey. I kind of thought that that was where I was going to go, and I didn't like it. I left, and I went to the Florida Keys. Um, in the Florida Keys, I wound up as a as a boat driver, as a charter boat captain. I worked for a guy for a couple of years, and and uh, eventually built my own boat and built my own business. And I guess this year in 2021 would be my. Uh, uh, I think it's it's my 58th year hmm. as a tarpon guide in the Florida Keys. It'll actually be my 57th because I didn't go in 2020 due to the due to the COVID. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I you know I did that. My wife and I had a had a resort with a with a fly shop and a tackle shop, and I had a couple of charter boats that I operated. I had an offshore boat, a flats boat. And, and uh, when we opened our shop in the mid seventies, we became a, uh, we became a travel service. So we used to travel all over and fish in different locations and send people and having that travel service and that booking service, we booked guides and sent people all over the place. In, in the early years when I was fly fishing, there really wasn't enough fly fishermen to keep somebody busy year round. So, you know, in, in a year we might fish 10 days of fly fishermen. So we didn't get much practice in. And I would say it was in the early to mid 1970s when it really started to take off and you could actually fish con- you could actually claim to be a fly fish, fly fishing guide and, and fish mostly fly fishermen. And by, by the late 1970s, I didn't do anything but fly fish. And I kind of did that for many, many years. I mean, that's just all I did. Um, lost my wife in 1991 and, uh, I kind of, we'd gotten out of the, property business down there and uh, and just kept the charter boats uh, i i worked with some real manufacturers i actually had a real manufacturing company that i built reels for a bunch of people in the 70s and 80s but when my uh, when my wife passed i wound up uh just making a decision that i wanted to spend the rest of my life chasing billfish with a fly rod and uh i had been doing it a lot and i loved it but found out that the tackle wasn't really as good as it needed to be so i worked with a lot of people on that and from 91 until now i've been running sailfish schools and and uh, billfish schools and i've caught you know, probably my clients at my schools have caught more billfish than any any other charter boat guy in the world. Yeah, and that's you know, I'm that's where I am now. I just basically I coach people and in, in, into catching billfish on a fly rod. I travel all over the world where I have trained crews and captains and mates and supply equipment and. Uh, and supply them with clients and take people fly fishing for all nine species of billfish and hopefully catch everybody what they're looking to catch. Wow. Yeah. There's uh, it, that's a great uh, su- quick summary. I know we left a lot on the table there, but um, so I do want to get into billfish. I think that's something that I, I'm interested in. I, you know, it's something I'd love to do eventually. I, I'm kind of curious, you know, you mentioned the tarpon fishing. It sounds like you still Uh, do some of the tarpon fishing but you know how what are the challenges with bill fishing and how does that does that compare to any of these other species at all if somebody say had done some other saltwater species or is bill fish just a whole nother whole nother game well basically the 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 thing starts out i guess for most people that most people that i find it's you know they're uh, i i think the majority of fly fishermen are or used to be trout fishermen and then we would get them, uh, they would read about or hear about or s- hear a radio show or even later on a TV show about about catching saltwater fish on the fly rod. 
And I would say that, you know, in this, in, in the early years, the majority of my clients were, were, were trout fishermen that wanted to catch something in the salt water and they would come down. And in the keys, our, our big three, what we called the big three or the grand slam was the bonefish, the permit and the tarpon. So we would start them out with bonefish and catch a lot of people bonefish. I had a, I had a school in the Bahamas, um, at the peace and plenty in Georgetown Exuma. Uh, we started a school over there in the 1970s. Uh, it was called the bonefish school. Hmm. And basically I had a lot of, a lot of famous casters and fishermen and fly tires as, as uh, instructors and I would sell trips to people that were a seven day trip where you would come in on a Sunday and you would leave to go home on a Sunday and you had two days of classroom instruction where we taught everything from, from, from tying flies and rigging a fly rod and, and rigging a reel with, with, with the backing and the fly lines and building leaders, uh, everything about hooks and flies and then we would we would teach them how to cast and after two days with these experts and every one of these people that that really came down that couldn't throw a fly 30 feet could could actually quickly make a cast and cast at a fly fifth the cast at a fish 50 or 60 feet away and hit the target and then at the end of that second day, we actually had them fishing on the beach there and catching a bonefish. We had them right on the beach. And then for, for the next four days, every one of those students would go out with a guide and, and one of the instructors. And they would catch dozens of bonefish. And that was like, that was the beginning of the bonefish school. I th- Larry Dalberg once wrote a, an article. I think it was in Chevrolet Outdoors. It was the magazine that they sent to uh, that they sent to everybody that bought a suburban or a pickup truck. <laughs> nice. And Larry wrote an article about saltwater fly fishing schools. And he talked about Mayan. And then later on, Orvis got one. And later on, Sandy Moret did one. But my bonefish school was, was really, the, as far as I know, was the first, you know, full-blown saltwater fly fishing school um, to operate. Wow. And, and, and so I taught people to catch bonefish. But then they said, you know, I'd really like to catch some of those bigger fish. How about that tarpon? <laughs> So then I created a, a, a group of people that wanted to tarp and fish. And, and I had never in my whole career ever advertised for customers. People just found me. And I think because we were one of the early people doing it and, and uh, people would find us and I would take them tarp and fish. And well, now I'm, I'm fishing tarpon and then you know in the off season when the tarpon and bonefish wasn't good we would be fishing offshore in the keys Mm -hmm. but but i'd be sending people and fishing in different areas and i would always i would always at home my favorite thing was was taking the other boat and run offshore and and go out there and try to catch a sailfish and i caught i guess my first and first 50 fish that I caught on fly that were billfish were Atlantic sailfish. And I caught them doing something that was unique that, that, that I don't even think too many people do. We were using a kite with a bait suspended in the surface and we were anchored on the reef and the sailfish swimming up and down the reef would come up and chase that bait. Of course it didn't have a hook in it. Hmm. And the line was going straight up to the kite and then through a pulley and down to a rod. So when they would attack that bait that was splashing on the surface, you just lift lift the rod tip and it would lift that bait straight up toward the kite. The fish would miss it. And then you put it right back down and you'd get excited and come back in again. And on the third charge, 
one person would lift the bait. The other guy would drop the fly where the bait was and boom, they would hit it and we would catch them on the fly. And that was, that was called kite fishing. Only, Only it was fly fishing using a kite. And we, everybody in the keys did that for, for years. Uh, but it was done, it was done with a hook in the bait and you just let them eat it. And then it would pop out of like an outrigger holder. But, but we were doing it with a fly Mm. and it was, it was very, very exciting. So then in my travels, I, you know, I went, I spent time in Panama and in Costa Rica and in Mexico and, and Venezuela and, and just gradually caught a bunch of fish, uh, different species of billfish on the fly and, decided that, that that you know that's what i wanted to do but as far as as far as people how they start into it with my situation it was mainly people that in the olden days it was people that that just worked their way up and they got to know me and then they knew that i was doing this so they wanted to do it um, today in my schools um i have crews and boats and mates and stuff in different areas that do different species and we i know the time of the year and and tides and so forth the moons where it's going to be good for fly fishing for a species of billfish and i actually have people that contact me looking to do that that I don't think there's too many other people that specialize in that. And that's hmm. what I've been specializing in for the last 30 years. That's what I was going to ask you was on, you mentioned Costa Rica and, and specializing in a, in a species, I guess, you know, if, if we wanted to take it to maybe a species just to get a little focused for a minute um, and say blue Marlin, um, would you maybe just talk about when would be a good time if you wanted to go down to Costa Rica area, um, do blue Marlin, when would be the best time to do that? Costa Rica for blue Marlin fly fishing is unique in that, in that for years, uh, nobody had ever caught more than one or two blue Marlin in a day Hmm. ever on a fly. Um, and there was only half a dozen people in the world that had caught two in a day and and that was like very very rare a blue marlin is like the top of the food chain so when i started i was really i i chased blue marlin for god i think uh, 20 years Hmm. and and i lost i lost 119 hookups wow and I caught my 120th blue marlin in Venezuela, a 90 pounder. And over the next 15 years, I caught seven more. So it was like, and, and that was like a lot. Mm. I had more than most people in the world. Uh, there wasn't many people that had that many. And then it got, it got easier um, we were fishing um, the fish that were a lot easier, the sailfish um, in in Costa Rica, and then in 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 uh, Guatemala. I started with the sailfish, and that was kind of it. When we started that, even I started my my school in my sailfish school in Guatemala in in uh, two thousand and uh, I think it was. No, it was 1992. I started the sailfish school, and we uh, we moved to Guatemala in 2000, and f- I mean in 1994. And from 94 until now, we have averaged catching seven sailfish on fly per boat per day with people that have never done it before. That was the average number. But the first five or six years, um, we would catch a couple every day. Mm. And and then we would lose probably, 
we would catch maybe 20% of the fish that we, that we hooked. As we got better, we caught more. I, uh, I, I caught with Ron Hamlin. We were the first boot and I was the first angler ever to catch 10 sailfish on fly on 20 pound tip and in one day. And then it went on from there. The record was broken and again and again. And by the, by the, the, uh, 19, the, the, the mid 20, uh, 2010, 2012 in that time zone, um, the record had been gone all the way up and every boat fishing down there had caught had caught at least 40 sailfish on fly hmm. in a day and it was it got just crazy numbers and that all came from uh going back like you said to just new techniques and things you guys you were doing exactly we we built better rods and better reels and better we, we we used to when we started down there we were using uh we were using four inch reels and 30 pound dacron line and fly lines the fly lines were that that came out of the box if you put 20 pound tippet on them and you fight fight a fish for two or three fish you would break the fly line and not the 20 pound tippet because they were they were just designed so that back then nobody really knew how to apply pressure to a to a fish. So they didn't know that their fly lines were so weak. They started with a 23 or a 25 pound core, but when they extruded the hot vinyl onto the core to build the fly lines, the the, the molting vinyl, even though they cooled it quickly would break down the structure of the fibers in the in the core so the line started out as as 25 pound test but it would be like 18 or 16 pound test after the fly line was put in the box so uh, you know i can remember going through like five or six fly lines in a day jeez and I couldn't believe it, so I went and I worked with uh, I worked with a guy called Marlon Roosh, who was the the uh, scientist at uh, at Rio, uh, and we designed a, a fly line that had a had a sixty five pound core, and and it was very very small in diameter, so it would pull through the water easy without putting a lot more pressure on the tippet, but it. And it was a harder coating because the other thing that was happening with the fly lines was that the snake guides were like when you put enough pressure on a fish, which we started doing once we get got into this bill fishing and got really good drags on reels, we would start applying a lot of pressure, even though it was 20 pound test. And these fish are so fast that pulling that fly line over the snake guides would be like pulling a fly line over a butter knife <laughs> and it would just heat it up and it would peel the, peel the coating off oh, and wow. break the core. So um, we built a fly line that had a harder coat on it and a, a smaller diameter so it would slide through the water. Still a, a sinking line that was short that we could use with a, with, with a running line and the running lines we made were stretchable so that, so that you didn't you see had some stretch for for security when a fish surged he didn't break your tippet uh little things like that and then when we worked with i worked with uh, uh originally with gary loomis and don green but later on when i i worked with lefty cray and 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 uh rick pope at tfo developing a fly rod and the fly rods that we build for billfish, it's called the blue water heavy duty and the blue water medium duty rods. One of the things that I put on the rods that I designed is we did away with all snake guides. Mm. The snake guides are, are, are a traditional guide on a fly line, but it comes from tradition. And it really helps in casting a fly a long distance and accurate. But when you're fishing for billfish, your casts are not very long and you're throwing a big fly 
and you don't have to be accurate. You got to take that fly and plop it in the water. So the fish hears it hit. Mm. You don't, you don't want a smooth presentation. You want a, a big, big open loop that goes plop yeah. when the popper hits the water and you want the fish to hear it hit. Mm. So, so with this, with these, these rods, once the fish is on the, the, the guides are like one of the most important things that we did. And we were one of the few people that, that ever did that, that built, built, uh, uh, fly rods with, with conventional guides all the way up instead of snake guides. And we made a, we made a one piece lifting grip. That's almost like a, a lifting grip on a, on a spay rod so that, when you're fighting the fish, you can slide your hand. Everybody's at different height. It still has the double fill, full well to cast with, but but when you're fighting a fish, you're sliding your hand up and down the rod. Originally, when I designed these things, we we did what tradition had, and we had the full well, and then a space, and then another little piece that went up above that. A lot of the companies are still doing that, but that, that came from... Stu App originally was the first guy that he used to take a even tarpon fish and took a 12 weight and he always carried a piece of rubber hose with him and he slid it down one side and after he made the cast and hooked the fish he put that thing up on the blank so that he could lift with oh, it yeah. without grabbing that blank so eventually we started building cork yep. foregrips like that for lifting grips but after when you're when you're fishing tarpon, that works okay. But when you get into billfish, they're faster and much more powerful. And you got to be able to be ready for a long battle. So we, I just basically changed that handle and made it into a one piece. And it's, it's so much easier to handle. Hmm. We also, uh, you know, got the IGFA to, to, uh, to, to make a rule for the length of a fighting butt. So you could get a bigger fly reel and get it on there. And that way you had a fighting butt that was long enough that would keep the reel from getting tangled in your shirt. And stuff. Yeah. So you're allowed to have a, 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 according to IGFA rules, you're allowed to have a up to a six inch fighting butt on the rod. And then the other thing that, that we built was, I guess when you're gone bill fishing with a fly rod, pretty much, Everywhere you go, you're going to be traveling someplace. Yeah. And the old one-piece rods we used to use for tarpon and the keys wouldn't work. So even two-piece rods, you got where you couldn't carry them on a plane. So we started with a three-piece, and then they got where they changed the rules on the length that you were allowed to carry on. So I changed the rod, and I made it into a four-piece, eight-and-a-half-foot billfish rod. And that'll go into a 28 inch suitcase. So you can just carry it with you no matter where you go in the world. And it's stronger than any one piece rod made. I mean, it's just, it's amazing what they did with the, the design of the ferrules today. You know, a, a multi piece rod is, is just as strong or stronger than any, than any one piece rod. So that, and then the, the, the other thing uh, that, that we did when I, started the reels the drags on the reels weren't very good and you know we used billy pate reels and and uh, uh, the old fin or reels we started and then we got into pen build a reel a pen build a fly reel that was the first carbon fiber drag but i worked with a guy named jack charlton and uh, he came up with the first really good solid sealed drag fly reel that was repeatable and um, it was called the charlton reel and i used that for a while and then they he went out of business and uh, sold that company and a few years later he called me up and i went to work with him and he he and his wife put together a company called mako reels and I worked with them ever since they started designing the reels. Actually, I have the first reel built in my collection. And uh, those reels are are so accurate and so repeatable that pretty much I would say 80, 90% of the people in the world that that uh, 
that fly fish for billfish wind up eventually, no matter what reel that they're using, that works for everything else. But when you get up and you go with marlin fishing, you really need to get one of those big Mako reels. They're, the, they're just the, – the braking system on them is, is stronger. Hmm. But more than that, more smooth and more accurate – uh, when you're fighting a, a, a sailfish, let's say, or a tarp, and uh, the speed rating, I, I developed a speed rating for fish, for billfish, and and for big fish that jump, really, but I call it my billfish scoring mode. And if you take a tarpon and a sailfish that both weigh 100 pounds and you hook them on the same rod, the same reel, the same everything, in in a hundred feet of water, and you fight them, the uh, or let's say five hundred feet of water, and you fight them, they the sailfish is a little bit faster, the tarpon's a little bit stronger, but they would actually get a speed power rating of X, and then if you got a hundred pound white marlin or a hundred pound striped marlin with the same equipment, same place, same everything that would have a speed power rating of XX double. And then if you got a hundred pound black Marlin on the same equipment, same stuff, it would have a speed power rating of XXX, which would be three times as powerful and fast as a tarp. And then when you go to a blue marlin or a bluefin tuna, you got about six X's. So yeah. everything that you do, you had asked me first about the blue fins. I mean, about the blue marlins. And, and I'm going to get to that, but I wanted to just let you know that you, we start out with the sailfish and the smaller marlins and stuff. And the blue marlin were so difficult. But since Jack's reels and and uh, gel spun or spectra backing and and the connections that we make the loop the loop eighty pound Dacron connections and the and the monofilament running line and the, yeah. and the the super duper fly lines and 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 the chemically sharpened hooks. When I started, every hook that came out of the box was dull and every every guy had to have a file in their pocket Mm -hmm. and we filed every hook and if you if you caught a fish on it then you had to file it again because it was dull yeah the chemically sharp and hardened hooks are just incredible they they work so much better so with all of those those uh developments and then the amount of time put in uh, you know, I, I've been fishing those sailfish hard in, in just in Guatemala for, for 30 years now. And, and the, the captains and crews and mates have caught every one of them has caught 10,000 sailfish, you know, wow. <laughs> it's, I, I wanted to get into that. I, I wanted to get into the, I'm glad I started with the, we started with the blue Marlin because I think it sounds like you know, a lot of the developments and gear and stuff was based on some of those, the bigger fish, but, um, maybe you can just take us back before we jump into that, just really quickly and talk for somebody who doesn't know anything about billfish or sailfish. Uh, can you talk about what the, the main species that you're fishing for? And is there a difference between a sailfish and a billfish? Just give us a quick little, like, uh, you know, kind of biology one one Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, well, billfish is a fish that has a, that has a point on the front, a note, a nose that has a thing that looks like a, like a spear on the front. And, and they, there's nine species. Uh, there's, there's, uh, seven species that we chase pretty regular with a fly. Um, and there's, there's like the first few that we, that were chased were, were the easier ones, which were the Atlantic sailfish and the Pacific sailfish. The Atlantic sailfish are, are, are a little tougher to catch, but they're much smaller. The Pacific sailfish um, are any, found anywhere in the warm Pacific Ocean, and they're, they are, uh, they're bigger. They're, you know, it's not uncommon to catch a, 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 a 60 to 100-pound 
uh, and they go up to 180 pound sailfish. Uh, whereas the Atlantic sailfish, a big one, a really big one is 60 pounds. You know, they don't get much bigger than that. And the average is about 30, 40 pounds. So you got the Atlantic sailfish and the Pacific sailfish and, and I, I fish for the Atlantics anywhere. And, you know, theoretically anywhere from Florida down to Venezuela and, and Mexico and anywhere in between uh, over in the islands. And then, uh, in the Pacific side, uh, you catch sailfish pretty much most places in the Pacific where it's where it's warm. Um, the best in the world is Guatemala, and uh, it's unique in that they have a law against killing them there, and there's not that many not that many boats fishing, um, and that and and there are the the best trained people. So we chase the sailfish there. The White marlin are an, are a uh, Atlantic Ocean fish, and uh, the best place to catch them probably is either North Carolina, off the coast in the Gulf Stream here, or probably better yet is down around the Dominican Republic in Jamaica and in Venezuela, and they catch a lot of them also in Mexico. Um, the the uh, the striped marlin is in the Pacific Ocean, and the best places to go for them, number one in the world, is up around from Cabo San Lucas up to Magdalena Bay, Mexico, on the Pacific side. Uh, Magdalena Bay is just like the most incredible fishery for any marlin, ever, any place in the world. Logistics are hard. It's really difficult to get there, and there's no place really to go once you're there so you kind of have to have a really big boat and you're traveling 180 miles one way to get to where you're going to be fishing so you got to go stay for a few days uh, but that's the best striped marlin fishing another great fishery for striped marlin is in the galapagos national park and there's a few boats out there that do it i spent probably nine years out there chasing striped marlin on fly then the black marlin, you can catch along the Pacific coast and, and out around the Galapagos. Uh, the best place is probably in Australia. And they are the second most powerful of all the marlins and grow to be um, the biggest. Well, actually, they're the biggest as far as the records are concerned. There have been non-record fish caught that were caught commercially and that were blue marlins that were bigger than the blacks. But uh, black marlin get up up to 1500 pounds Jeez. and uh, they're a wonderful fish and like i said they're they're it's they're a great fish for fly fishing but uh it's you got to travel a long way to get to them the best place is, is australia um there's places on the on the east coast of australia and then over in uh, on the west coast uh, there's a there's areas where you can actually catch them up on the flats, sight cast, and while they're balling ballyhoo uh, in 15 feet of water on white sand bottom. Hmm. And these are fi these are fish from 30 to 80 pounds, but it's still they're black marlin, and you can actually catch them out of a flats boat. P pretty crazy. Wow. And then the blue marlins, there's two of them. There's the Atlantic blue marlin and the Pacific. That is the most powerful and biggest of all the billfish and the apex predator. Um, the Atlantic blue marlin uh, goes all the way from North Carolina all the way down to Brazil. And uh, my favorite place, the best place for me to catch them is, is uh, on the fly rod. Is, it used to be in Venezuela when you could go there. You can't go there anymore. So now when I go to catch a blue marlin on fly uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, I go and I have a team set up down in, in Dominican Republic. And then the, the, the Pacific blue marlin, uh, which we catch some in Guatemala and we catch them in Panama. They, they catch them in, in, in Hawaii, Australia. It's all good. Um, we found a, a place in off of the coast of Costa Rica that's 
that's a big trench that's a hundred and it's more than a hundred miles offshore and it's about 80 miles wide and 150 miles long and it's got a bunch of mountain ranges in it that are underwater mountain ranges in the deep part it's 18,000 feet deep and the tops of these mountains are probably 1200 feet below the surface and we have figured out ways to put structure on top of them drop an anchor and actually have a have a line coming up with a float that has some structure on it that holds bait and they call these fads they use them in different locations and basically what they do is instead of the bait being scattered anytime that there's any structure that bait comes and hangs around that structure and in this trench there are thousands and thousands and thousands of blue marlin that are migratory fish coming through there they're mostly males they're fish under 500 pounds there's a few bit females that are caught in there but mostly males and and the males of the blue marlin are the smaller of them they they turn into females as they as they get older hmm. so when they you know when they get up up over over four 400 pounds or so then they're then they turn into females anyway the the, this location that we have is uh, is off of Costa Rica, and I go down there. The prime time that they're actually coming through there, when we've tagged them and we know that they're there, is is during June, July, and August. And I operate a fly fishing school for blue marlin there. Uh, I've been there now. This will be the ninth year. <clears throat> I fish on a boat called the Dragonfly, <clears throat> and uh, I have a team a crew, James Smith and a fellow named Berto. And we, uh, we have people to come down every week. Once a week, I have people come in on, on, uh, Sundays and they, we pick them up the airport. They stay at my condo at Las Sueños and we head offshore on Monday and we get actually get out there to where the fads are at dawn on Tuesday morning and we fish three 14 hour days of fly fishing for Bloom Island. And at night we just put out a sea anchor and sleep. And then we come back in on Thursday night after fishing, get to the dock on Friday. My customers go home on Saturday and we clean everything up, get ready and go out again. And we do that for 12 weeks in a row. And, uh, I think I've made now during the, during the nine or we actually, it was eight years that we fished. Um, we've made over 60 trips. I think it was 64 trips. And then the 64 trips out there, my clients have all caught blue marl and everybody except one guy. And the guy that didn't catch one hooked 14, but he just, he's, he's such a great angler that he just could not listen to the technique <laughs> that you have to use to do it. And he kept pulling hard on the things and breaking them off. So finally we were actually shooting a TV show and he made me catch a couple of them just to show him that it could be done. <laughs> Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Sawyer offers a full line of modern and traditional products for oarsmen, canoeists, kayakers, surfers, and paddlers of all genres, providing unsurpassed function, performance, and beauty. They design and handcraft every product in the USA, ensuring everything they make is from the highest quality materials with careful attention to detail. They take pride in their employees, stewardship of the environment, and our country. In return, you have the assurance of knowing the product you receive from them is genuine, made in America, and cannot be replicated. I've been using Sawyer products for a long time now, which is why I'm definitely excited to share them with you on the podcast here. I've been down some crazy technical whitewater and uh, mini fishing adventures that put me in places that were... um, where I had to make a good move. And I, I love the design, the power, the performance, and always knowing that um, I can count on that stroke, even when you need to make you know that one to get past the rock or whatever. You can always count on Sawyer for that. And you can count on them as well. Sawyer products are designed by paddlers, oarsmen, and surfers alike to fully meet your performance needs. Pick up one today and experience the feel of water. 
Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to grab your set today. That's Sawyer, S-A-W-Y-E-R, wetflyswing.com slash Sawyer to get started. OPST's rods represent decades of dedication to sustained anchor two-handed casting. A rod reflects its designer, and these rods are a true illustration of Skagit Master Ed Ward's vision. The Pure Skagit series falls right in line with OPST's principles, a short, medium, fast-action rod that sports an extra-sensitive tip, all while maintaining a powerful lower section that's true and sure to leave you impressed by its feather-launching potential. And I've been using this rod for steelhead uh, lately and been blown away by its lightweight and, and the power it packs. You almost don't realize it's in your hand. It's Seriously, it's like um, it's ultralight. So that was, you know, thinking about how to describe this thing. I think that's the word that comes back to me. Uh, I was casting some big flies for steelhead with a sink tip and a bunch of wind. And I didn't have a problem at all, even with my less than perfect uh, casting technique. So... I've been impressed with the 11 foot 7 weight, but there is a huge uh, line. They have uh, three different rods in the lineup uh, from 6 to uh, 9 weights and from 10 foot 8 inch all the way up to 12 foot 3 inch, which pretty much for me covers covers it all. So um, I'm excited, excited to dig into more of this. Uh, these rods actually diverge from the micro series in a few ways. The upper grips are double weld and thus aligned uh, for the contemporary two handed rods. Uh, while the lower handle still remains switch style. Uh, these rods are also slightly faster than the micro series, being a true medium fast action that utilizes the upper third of the rod. Targeted towards fishing large trout and up to Canadian and Alaskan king salmon, this series should cover all the bases when targeting those larger fish. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash OPST to check out the lineup right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash OPST. Okay, back to the show. So that paints a picture of a definitely that Costa Rica fishery. And I mean, there's obviously a ton of uh, things we could dig into. I was hoping to, you know, I mean, dig it a little more into, you know, kind of what it takes. Like, well, I guess the first question would to be. To catch them? Well, there's the catching them. And then there's just the, if, if somebody is new to this is, you know, what do you tell them? Do you tell them, come on down and catch a blue marlin or is there more of a steps to getting up to there? Should they go for tarpon well, first? You know, any of that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there's, there are people that, ha- that are, that are bill fishermen that have fished with conventional tackle for years. And they say, man, I would like to catch one and I'm going to fly. Well, yeah, I can, I can make that happen if you'll listen to what I say. But in general, most of the people, I would recommend that they go and, and work their way up, that they go to go to Guatemala or, or go someplace where there's a, where there's a lot of fish and and catch a bunch of fish. Go to go to go to. It's not the same catching a sailfish as it is a marlin. I mean, it's, it's so far different. It's the same as catching a the difference between a hundred pound sailfish and a and a uh, 250 pound blue marlin is the same as the difference between a five pound bass and, a, and a hundred pound tarpon. Right. You know, I mean, it's just, it's two different games that you have to play, but I can teach you both. Yeah. The, the thing that if, if, if I, if, if you write an article or if I, if I teach you how to catch sailfish on a fly and then a blue marlin pops up and you use that same technique you're going to break them off every time mm-hmm. we, uh, we've actually, it's only been up until we found this place in Costa Rica and started going out there and putting the time in out there. Uh, nobody had ever caught, like I said, more than two blue Marlin in a day ever. Yeah. And, and now we've got several boats out there that have, ca- that have caught, uh, more than a dozen in a day gotcha you know and it's never been done I mean, nothing. that's amazing i mean it sounds like yeah obviously you were there i mean you've developed this whole thing you've been along there a long way what is the you know so the more of the low-hanging fruit so where would that trip be so let's say you know the big one you just talked about costa rica going out and you know the three days 14 hours a day what would be the lower hanging flute uh, uh fruit trip to do where you could actually go maybe it's a you know a little easier to do well, yeah I do my like my schools in Guatemala. They're they're uh, oh, 
they're probably the most reasonably priced and they're you know you're staying in a five-star lodge and you're fishing on a because it's calm there we don't have to fish big boats all the time so we're fishing smaller boats and and the boats that we're fishing are 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 37 to 45 foot boats and they're 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 old wooden boats because wooden boats raise more fish than fiberglass boats. Uh, they're they're they've all been restored. They're they're like the old Rolls Royce boats. Yeah. Sonny. They, you know they're Murrits and Rybovichs and stuff like that. And that's the that's the ultimate vessel because they make less white water, which means that you can tease the fish in closer to the boat. Huh. The wake, the wake is much less, and the sound, the harmonics of a boat that's built out of wood with diesels, as opposed as opposed yep. to a boat that's built out of out of fiberglass, the sound is so much different. The fish, the 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 wooden boats raise a lot more fish, so you can go down there, stay in a five star lodge, you fly in on, it's really simple. You get on an airplane, you fly in on a, on, on, on a day one. Uh, you can fly. It's like from Texas or Miami or Atlanta. It's all a three hour flight hmm. or less. And you get off the plane. Uh, we have a driver that picks you up in a limo, brings you. It's a two hour flight from from 5000 feet. You're up in the mountains in Guatemala City. You go down the go down the winding mountain super super highway. And then you got about 50 miles of coastal plain that's growing sugarcane, and you come into this gate and you come through the gate and you're in a five star lodge. Um, the lodges are spectacular. The the boats are great. The swimming pools and everything. So you get there, you take a swim, have a drink, and I go through with you the tackle and what we're going to do and how it's going to work. Because a lot of my people never did it, never have any idea what they're doing. So we go through everything. We have. We have fish mounts and pictures and everything in the lodge, but but I actually go through pulling on the pulling on the line and having you cast in the swimming pool and stuff. Hmm. The next day uh, we get up at we get, we get up at, at uh, five in the morning and and you eat breakfast uh, between between five forty five and six forty five and go to the boat at seven o'clock. You leave the dock and you're out there fishing somewhere between a half hour and an hour and a half out to the fishing grounds and we put the teasers out and you're pulling basically you have a captain and two mates and i can take one two three or four anglers and it, we start pulling these teasers and the teasers are nothing more than a bait uh with a lure slid over top of them with no hook and you have one for each mate and one for the captain and when the fish pops up on him the angler, if he's right-handed, is on the aft port corner of the vessel or on the, looking back on the right-hand side. All the teasers are on the left-hand side. So when the fish pops up, you have your fly already stripped out, ready to go, and it's laying there on the deck. You got your rod there ready to pick up. When, when the fish pops up, you walk back, pick up the rod, Put your fly in the water and let it slide back into the into the water about 20 feet out. And in the meantime, two of the teasers come in and the fish is coming in and you're watching him coming in, chasing this teaser. The boat's gone along slow and, and the fish is coming fast after that teaser. When the fish is about 40 feet out, the captain pulls the boat out of gear and yells, cast. <laughs> you you water load your fly pick it up and you throw it where the teaser is as the as the te as your fly is coming down my mate yanks that teaser out of the water and your fly lands the fish sees it you pop it once and he turns and he eats it and takes off jumping wow wow and, it, and you're it's all with it's all it's all within 25 feet of the boat so you've got like a front row seat looking straight at it crystal clear beautiful water Jeez. That's you know, er, everything's in the in the high eighties, the air temperature and water temperature, and and these fish are, you know, they're ten, twelve feet long, and they're lit up on beautiful colors, and they come out of the water and just go crazy. So that trip, 
the, you know, is, uh, yeah, that sounds for, amazing. For one, for one person to do that trip by themselves, if you just want all the action and you want to be with me and learn everything there is to learn, uh, it, it's, it's roughly around 9,000 bucks. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's three full days, all your meals, all your lodging and, and, and your ground transportation, everything in country, once you get in country, except gratuities and, uh, and the gratuities, are, we recommend like, uh, $300 a day for the captain and two mates. Mm-hmm. So, so for that, for that trip, your gratuity would be 900 bucks plus a a hundred bucks for the, for the lodge. So you, a thousand dollars in tips yeah. and, and the trip, that trip be 900 for, for, or 9,000 for one angler, but two anglers, it would be five oh, wow. each. And then three anglers, it would be four each and four, four anglers. It would be 3000 each. So, so it, it all depends on the people that the number of people, you know, of course you get, each time you add a person, you get less shots yourself. Gotcha. We rotate the people. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So you get less shots. So, so on that boat, let's take so so in if you had say th- three guys, um, and you said so, is it three days on the water? Yeah, it's three days, and uh, and, and the average, uh, of course, it, it, to get to an average, you have to have lower and higher. Yeah. But the average fishing, we catch seven a day on yeah. fly. And twenty a day if you're bait fishing. It's the best sail fishing in the world. Period. And what species are you focusing on here? Sailfish. Uh, just, Pacific sailfish. Just okay. Yeah, Pacific sailfish. Gotcha. So I'm just going back to my yeah. Uh, yeah. And every now, every now and then, we catch a blue marlin there. Every now and then, we catch a striped marlin or a black marlin. It's possible, but yeah, you know, out of a hundred fish. 97 of them are going to be sailfish. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, and I don't know if the comparison's similar, but you know, you've got the, you know, you've got the giant tarpon and then you've got the baby tarpon. And to me, you know, it, it seems like maybe the baby tarpon, you know, might be, I don't know. I mean, j- almost as good because you could, you know what I mean? Like the giant sounds like it's so much work is, is, is the marlin the same thing where it's almost, you get one of those giant marlin. Um, I mean, wh- which one do you choose? <laughs> If I if I had a choice to catch one fish for the rest of my life, it would be a blue model. Okay, it would be blue. Period. No no question. So that's easy. For yeah. years when I was a flats fisherman, it would have been a permit. Oh really? Over over a tarpon. Yeah. The, the permit would be the hardest and the most difficult and, and the, the most rewarding. That was in the old days. Today they're catching a lot of small permit and stuff and, and it's but it, they're still very, very, very difficult to catch. But the tarpon now are difficult to catch for, for flying. There's also, you know, it, yeah. it, it, depending on where you are. I, you know, I, 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 I've been doing it so long that the tarpon has, you know, paid for me to live my whole life. So I, yeah. I don't, uh, you know, I, that, that's my number one fish. But, but if I, if you just said you, you, you can only catch one more fish before you die, uh, what do you want to catch? And I, it would be a blue marlin. It's the, it's the, it's the apex predator, but we used to talk about, I mean, I, I've heard it referred to as guys that say, I'm going to fly fish for blue marlin and, and people that really knew what they were talking about said that, you know, if you, can you compare that to something? And you say, yeah, I can compare it to like golfing. It's like shooting three hole in ones in a row on par fives mm. is catching a blue marlin on fly. Wow. Or it's like going to Africa hunting and specifically hunting for a white rhinoceros with a bow and arrow. That's the degree of difficulty that it used to be. But now it's to the point where I can take a man, woman, or child and if they follow my directions, I figured out ways that we can catch blue marlin on the fly. And we can catch them pretty consistently. It's all a lot easier than it used to be. A tarpon, the big tarpon that you worry about, you know, they're, they're, they're not, when in a lot of the books and the stuff that we used to do for years, uh, the blue marlin was always a, uh, a situation where, um, I mean, the tarpon was a situation where if you caught a hundred pound tarpon on 20 pound tippet, it was going to take you 20 to 30 minutes to land it. But 
from the techniques and stuff that I learned about catching the blue marlin on fly, I now hook a, a hundred pound tarp and have it laying on its side in five or six minutes. Yeah. Which is great. And I can teach that to anybody. So you don't, the, the, my object at, at 79 years old is, is that I'm not as strong or, or, or as fast or, or as powerful as I once was. So I got to be smarter. You got to outsmart the fish. And I just developed, uh, figured out techniques on how to wear a fish out without wearing the angler out. And that, uh, that's cool. The, the one, the first thing that I tell an angler when they, when they, when they go to catch a big fish on a fly is if you don't remember anything else that I tell you, I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of different stuff. And each one of these things is one or two or three or five or 10% improvement over doing it the way you're doing it but but there's going to be a hundred different things that you got to learn and 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 it, it might only improve by one percent but if you if you do if you learn 10 of them then you're 10 percent better than you are yeah and if you only remember one thing that i teach is that no matter what trick that that marlin or that tarpon uses on you no matter what he does to trick you don't allow him to ever put a bend in that rod after he sucked. Ever. Don't allow him to put a bend in the rod. Do not allow him to bend that rod. Don't bend that rod. The rod has to be straight the whole time. And that's crazy. And everybody will tell you it's crazy, except that the people that do it, it took like catching big 40 pound Jack Cavells. Lefty, he say he used to take him, used to take him 25 minutes to catch one. After he used my technique, he was catching them and, three or four minutes gotcha and what what do you mean by not bending it describe that a little more well when you have a reel that you can tell exactly what the pressure is on the point of that hook then you can point the rod dead straight at the fish and adjust that reel and apply five times as much pressure to a fish holding the rod loosely in your hand as you can if you're palming the spool and trying to bend the rod. When you bend the rod, the more the rod bends, the less pressure the fish feels and the more pressure the angler feels. It's physics. It has to do with the, it it basically has to do with, with a lever, any lever uh, if you get the short end of the stick and the fish has the long end of the stick, then the fish has the, 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 the strong end of the lever and you have the, the weak end of the lever. And there's no way, no way you get around that. If you, if you take a scale and you hook it to a tree and you yeah. take your fly rod and you hook your fly rod and you walk back 50 feet and then you get the line tight and then you start bending that rod and pull as hard as you can. It's very difficult to pull that scale up to four pounds, gotcha. but, it, but if you, but if you point the rod straight at it and you just yep. pull straight away, you can pull 20 pounds with two fingers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What would you say to somebody? Cause this sounds really interesting. I mean, obviously that sounds like it works, you know, playing devil's advocate a little bit here. We've talked about before, just on other types of fishing, you know, how, you know, to be fly fishing, you should be casting and things like that. What would you tell to somebody that, that says, like, it doesn't sound like you, you're not really casting that much. You're not really bending the rod. How much is it fly fishing and how much is it? Could you just do this with any sort of rod? Well, when you're when you're casting, every cast for every kind of fish is different. That's why we learn to cast. Yeah. And you have to be able... The, the flies and the lines and everything we're using for the billfish, you have to learn how to cast them properly. If you don't, you don't catch the fish. Yeah. So you are so casting. It's, yeah. It's, it's the same. And now as far as fighting fish, any fish that you have, if you, I, I, when I grew up, I used to do with my dad, we used to do hand lining for bottom. That's right. And you'd, you'd hook them with a hand line. You could feel that nibble and you'd pull and then you're pulling hand over hand. Well, that's a straight line. Yep. Physics tells you that if the line is straight, then then you do it. But if you were to take that and tie it, tie the line to a strict a stick that was five feet long, just a solid stick, and then you hold the bottom end of that stick and you pull on it and try to lift that fish up from the bottom, you couldn't do it because the fish has the long end of the lever. Does that make sense in physics? 
Yeah, yeah, I think it does. So, so basically, clarify that again. If, if you take a weight and put it on a string and have it sitting on the ground, and you take that string and you pick it straight up with your hand, you can, let's say it's five pounds, you can just pick it right up. But then take that same weight and you tie your line on it and get on the end of your fly on your your fly rod and then try to pick that five pounds off the ground. Yeah. And the rod will bend and bend and bend and you'll be killing yourself and you won't be able to move the weight. It's it, so, so the straight line is the most efficient way to do it. It's the same with a cast. If you read Ed, Jar- Ed Jarowski's new book about casting, you know, he's talking about a straight line, which is straight back coming forward as fast as possible and then your forward line when you're done is going 180 degrees and the longer your stroke the farther you can cast period that's a fact so so i'm doing the same thing only i'm doing using it for fighting fish but you can't do it if you don't have a smooth drag on a reel and a reel that you can tell exactly what your pressure that you're putting on for instance, a blue marlin, when, when you hook a blue marlin for the first five or ten minutes, if you put two pounds of pressure on your reel, when, when he eats the fly and he, hit, he comes tight on the reel, he breaks the tippet. But if you have one pound, he can't break it. And that line that I have, there's a <clears> – I <throat> actually – when that fish is going away at, at 40 miles an hour, that line starts to sink under him because it's so thin and it's got that stretch in that monofilament running line that the fish actually feels the line pulling down on him. So he stays on the surface and he keeps jumping until he wears himself out. If you were to tighten down a little bit and pull on him, then he would feel that you were pulling up on him. He would turn his pecs and go straight down. And when he gets down deep, he puts a bow in the line and breaks you off. Mm-hmm. There you go. There's like little, little thousands of these little things that we have learned. And I just try to share that with everybody that I can. And awesome. everybody that finally gets it says, wow, you know, I yeah. get it. No, it sounds amazing. And I think, you know, thinking about it, I think the Guatemala, Guatemala thing, it sounds like, or even you could even start, maybe start with you on tarpon and then work your way up to eventually maybe getting to that big, uh, you know, the big blue marlin. You know, for somebody that's that you know that doesn't have a lot of money, I mean, this is it costs money because it costs me money to rent these boats and hire the crews and everything. Mm-hmm. Everything costs money, but but uh, you know, the, if you want to catch a big fish on a fly rod, and you and you don't have a whole lot of money, uh, just talk to me about catching a tarpon. I can catch a hundred pound tarpon. I, I pretty much will will charge you six hundred dollars and take you out and catch you several hundred pound tarp and on fly. And, and for those that say, well, you know, what if we don't catch one then for the $600 that you're going to pay me to take you out there, I am willing to bet you double or nothing on that 600 that you will catch a hundred pound tarp huh. on fly that night. Wow. So, so if you don't catch one, you don't pay, but if you do, you pay 12, uh- if you accept the bet. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, this, this I never tur- lost. Yeah, <laughs> this has turned into a great episode. I mean, well, it's it's been great the whole time. But I, you know, I started out thinking big, but now that as we talk, it sounds like I mean, you obviously you've been doing this for a long time, so you've got um, everything covered. Uh, maybe we could, uh, you know, as we take start to think about taking out of here. Um, I did want to t- touch just quickly on Lefty because you mentioned him at the start, and um, I'm going to be doing kind of a you know, a celebration episode, uh, to talk about lefty and things like that. I haven't, I never interviewed him, but, um, do you have a story uh, on lefty? Did you know him pretty well? Well, I know him very well. Of course he was, uh, he he was a very good friend, uh, mentor taught me a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I met him. He was, when he lived in Baltimore, um, he used to come to club meetings in Wildwood, New Jersey, to that fly fishing club. Uh, he and Mark Sosen, Lefty came from Baltimore, and Mark came from North Jersey, and they used to they used to go to the, they were the two youngest guys in the club that my dad belonged to. Mm. And, of course, I was like 10 years old when I met him. So then years later, when I went to Florida to stay, Lefty ran the, the Met tournament down there, and 
you know, we became friends. We fished some. He, he just, you know, he, he was just probably, in my opinion, the, the most knowledgeable, the brilliant guy that I ever met, period. Hmm. And he, uh, when I went with uh, TFO, I mean, he used to come fish out of my marina there when I had the marina at Ferro Blanco. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, you know, as, as time went on, when I went to TFO, he was the, he and Rick Pope started that. And they're the ones that convinced me to come to that company and work with them designing these blue water rods and also testing pretty much most of their salt water rods. I mean, I, you know, I, I was catching more tarpon than everybody else. So that I was the one to really do it. And, and, and I could, I could run, you know, I could run tests on them. If they had a rod that wasn't, wasn't the right rod, it would break and then they could adjust it. So it wouldn't break. Uh, they, they knew what they wanted to design, but they, they weren't sure how strong it would be until I fished it. Yeah. And that's, that's, that was my part of my job. But the, for the last, you know, 15 years or 10 years with lefty you know at the shows i spent a lot of time with him i traveled with him i would you know spend an awful lot of time just hanging out with him and we became much much closer uh he uh he he i have i have a letter from him that he said jake i i've been using your technique and i just have to tell you something he said you uh he said, you and I both have been around this sport for a long time and we've met an awful lot of really smart, great fishermen. And this technique that you're using to catch these marlin on fly is really brilliant. I can't believe that with all the smart people in the world that a stupid guy like you figured this out. <laughs> There you go. That's the perfect, that's the perfect lefty you know, line. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. that was it. That's lefty. You know, he, he was, he was just, he was the best. There, there, there won't ever be another one. I mean, he was just by far the most, the most awesome. That's amazing. Person. That's amazing. He, he comp, he complimented you by, um, jo joking, right? I mean, it was a compliment, but he did yeah, it in right. his way. Yeah. As, exactly. That's exactly. so cool. That's so cool. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking coming up on the this for us we're coming up to 200 episodes, which is a b huge milestone. And and uh, on on 100, I interviewed Joan Wolf, and it was kind of I, uh -huh. I, I try to celebrate, you know, when I can, and you know, celebrate people that paved the way. And that's what's cool having you on here. I mean, obviously today, you know, uh, there's probably a lot of people that maybe haven't heard of you yet, and um, you know, I think it's it's pretty cool. And so you're 79, it sounds like now. I mean. How long, because almost eight, I mean, how long do you do this? And how many days are you fishing per year? Well, um, up until this COVID thing, I was, I, I used to brag that I never spent more than a hundred days a year in my own bed. Wow. I, uh, I was someplace else most of the time. And good places, warm, warm, nice, comfortable places, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I was, you know, my, I have a schedule that, that I still plan to keep, uh, when I get back to work. And, and basically I, I did, uh, I, my, my year would go like, uh, Guatemala, um, Dominican Republic or, or, uh, or, or Panama or Australia in january february and march and then florida keys tarpon fishing april and may costa rica blue marlin fly fishing june july and august september was my month off and i would go to alaska as a as a fisherman and fish for giant rainbows mm -hmm. the whole month of September. There then I know. would come home and I fish the false albacore here in the Florida Keys in, uh, in October and November, the false albacore and the giant redfish. Yeah. And then, and then in December back right back down to, uh, to, to, to the, one of the hotspot billfish places, Guatemala mainly. 
um, but but also uh, other hot spots. And I would go, I would do Australia every other year or every third year. Yeah. And, uh, and Dominican Republic when I could. You know, that would that would be a you know a, an on demand thing. <clears throat> I would personally prefer to fish in the Pacific Ocean because it's calmer than the Atlantic Ocean. And when you get when you get to be middle aged like I am, you're looking for calmer seas. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, let, let's take it out of here. I've got this little segment called the 222 Top Two Flies, Top Two Tips, Top Two Resources, and uh, we mentioned. I guess I don't know if we want to think. We talked a little about blue marlin. It might be better just talked about the uh, Pacific sailfish, since it seems like maybe that might be the one that would be easier if you're brand new to it to get going. Um, what would be, okay. are there, are there common fly? I mean, are, is there like one type of fly or a few things that we could look up and take a look at what you're using? Yeah. Well, you can go on my website, jakejordan.com and, and I, there's pictures of fish on there. You can see them on the internet. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Cam Siegler that was a really, really good friend of mine. That was, that was one of the early guys that started some of the early billfish tournaments. Uh, Cam used to run Eddie Bauer and he did a lot of development of different things in our industry, but he designed, he designed the early billfish fly, which is a cuphead um, fly. And the, most of the flies that we use for all billfish in general are pink and white. And, and this is a popper head pink and white fly. And you can put two of them together it's called a Cam Siegler fly. You can you can uh, mm-hmm. Google it, or you can check me. I make a I make a Jake Jordan Marlin fly that is oh, good for sale for some Marlin and stuff. And I have them here that I, that it's it's a we use all tube flies. We do not use flies with hooks in them. Uh, having tying flies that have that are tied on a hook for billfish cuts down your catch percentage by twenty five percent. Wow. So, so we use basically tube flies. So, uh, the flies that you see everybody using are going to be tube flies and they don't have to replicate what a fish looks like or anything. They have to be big and they have to be, be something that the fish can see. If they see them there, they tasted that bait in the, in the, in the teaser and, and they think they whacked it and it's sitting still on the surface. Nice. And if they don't eat it right now, it's, it's going to get away. So they attack it and they stick their head out of the water when they eat it. Dang. So you watch the fly go into the mouth of the fish 25 feet from you. And, and the reason for the pink flies, 99% of the ones you see are going to be on pink flies. Um, in the old days, before digital photography, when, when magazines were the hottest thing and gone, the art director's and uh, and the, uh, the photography directors of all the magazines would not accept a picture of a billfish unless it had a bright colored fly and they uh-huh. decided that they liked pink the best so that's the reason i've actually caught i've caught sailfish where i take a needle and i run my leader through a cigar put a hook on the back of it tie it on my fly rod and cast a cigar and the fish will just jump right on if needed. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. Color, it really doesn't. It needs to be, it needs to be bright because you can see that fly when you cast it where it hits and you can see the fish eating it. Yeah, that's it. But you could put And then any, when the anything, fish is yeah. jumping and everything in the pictures, you're always going to see that pink thing hanging out of his mouth. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, okay. so there's a couple of flies. And then uh, what about tips? Like, so again, somebody, let's think they're coming down there to fish maybe that Guatemala trip for you. What are a couple of tips they should be thinking about to prepare for that, to help them co- hook and land their first fish? Well, bas- ba- basically the, 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 the idea that I told you about the straight line. Yeah. First of all, don't come under gunned. Yes. You can catch one of these things with a 12 weight tarpon rod you are undergunned and it's not good for the fish and it's not good for the, for, for the angler. You're going to fight them for a much longer time. It's have a tough time landing them. Yeah. You can cast the fly and you can catch them. The thing is that if you have the right tools, the right reel and the right rods, and if you don't, 
the good part is that if you go to any of the places that I recommend for you to go, and you can call me up. I mean, I don't have to sell you the trip. I'll tell you where to go. Mm-hmm. But all of the boats that I recommend that you fish with all have the proper tackle on board so you don't have to bring anything. The, the good part about that Guatemala trip is that, that you can get out of work and have your suit and tie. Nice. Get on the airplane and go down there. And they've got sunscreen, they've got hats, they've got shirts, they got shorts, they've got everything that you will need to do your trip and, and they'll press and clean your suit for you. And when you go back, you just get off the plane and go to work. <laughs> there you go. You don't need a suitcase. Amazing. You just, you just need a bunch of hundred dollar bills. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. All right. So, um, that's good. So and then, uh, just, I, I guess, yeah, you covered the, the kind of some tips there, but what about like a resource? So again, somebody's going down there, you cover it all. So that's obviously you've got this thing covered, but if somebody wanted to learn a little more about these billfish and sailfish and stuff, is there a, like a book magazine resource video, anything you would recommend they might check out that maybe isn't your own stuff that's out there? Oh man, you go on YouTube and there's everything you can, you can find everything on YouTube, uh, you know, just Google billfish on flies and there's, okay. there's everything on there. The problem is that a lot of the stuff that's out there, the books, there, there was a great book written years ago by a guy. I'm trying to remember his name. He was a steelhead guy out of, Oh, oh yeah. Trey Combs, uh, Trey Combs, great billfish book. And at that time, <clears throat> Trey had interviewed a bunch of people, but the people he interviewed, dude he was going to write a boat and they didn't want to give him their secrets so there's a whole bunch of stuff in that book that won't work oh that's funny and then from the time that he wrote the book until 10 years ago everything that was in the book has changed completely 100 percent. so you need the up-to-date stuff and there really isn't a new book that's up to date, you know, you can, it, I would say the internet, follow the guys that do it. Who else other than you? I mean, you're probably one of the biggest names doing it. Are there any other names we would recognize that are doing the, the billfish thing? Well, uh, Sandy Moret does a lot of it, but he's not a, you know, he's not a, uh, uh, he's, he's not a, uh, uh you, you know, he's not, he's not Fine. selling the trips like I am, but, Oh, gotcha. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you can, you know, there's, there's a, uh, go to casavieja.lodge.com. How do you spell that? C-A-S-A-V-I-E-J-A-L-O-D-G-E. Oh, wow. Lodge. <laughs> nice. Dot right. com. Perfect. Uh, and, uh, you can go there and they'll, you can go through their website and they'll, they'll give you pictures and they probably got a little thing written in there that I wrote that basically tells about you know the equipment you need and so forth but a lot of that is even aged you know it's yeah. it's it's it uh, yeah. look look up uh, intensity sport fishing you know i just posted a thing on the internet yesterday where i sent a client from philadelphia never saw a sailfish never never fished salt water with a fly rod he went down there he, Yesterday, he caught nine sailfish out of 15 bites wow. on fly and 20-pound tip. It went by himself. There you go. Just fishing, fishing with a crew on the intensity. There you go. Um, but there are, you know, there's a lot of different really good stuff out there. Uh, that, you know, I can, what, what, what I find is, what I would recommend, if you really want to do, if you have an interest in learning about this. Yep. Call me, call me up. I'll talk to anybody oh, good. and I'll, I'll tell you anything I know. And then I will steer you in the direction that'll help you to get what you're looking for. I don't know if you know Meredith McCourt. Uh, no, no, she's, she's getting into it and I've been coaching her. She's doing really good. She's catching a lot of billfish, but there's a, there's an awful lot of people that are, you, you know, that get into this stuff. Um, and they're not, you know, they're just not doing it for a business. The, yeah. the people that are doing it for the business, there's charter boats out there. 
and and uh, you know i can recommend charter boats all over the world for sure. different people if, if you want to go tell me what you want to do and i'll put you in the right place with the right crew gotcha perfect perfect no that's a that's a great answer it, it sounds like uh, you know just you being a resource to, to call because i had definitely there are a few questions that we probably won't get to from listeners um that i'll just make make note they can give you a call and ask you uh, directly um, sure sure that'll be i'll be happy to answer them okay Perfect. Then I'll, I'll send, uh, I, I know Greg, uh, I'll send him your way. <laughs> he had a couple that I think were kind of running out of time here, but, um, so, and then just finishing that up. So, I mean, it sounds like, is it just the fishing? It sounds like it's almost like you're on vacation. So you're probably not going to be like having to retire. You're kind of just going to keep fishing, doing what you're doing. I'm going to do as long as I can. There yeah. You go. Yeah. I, I love it. I mean, there's not, th- there isn't anything else in the world that brings me the joy of being there and having somebody catch these things on a fly rod. There's just nothing else that gets me that excited. And, you know, I have, I, I have an awful, uh, awfully great group of people that are, that follow me that, that, uh, that do what I do. And, and realistically, like, you know, you're looking for somebody, to, to send them to, and there, there might be somebody out there, but I don't know of anybody else that does what I do. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it, it'd be a difficult, it'd be difficult for somebody unless they were single and, and, and like to be away Yeah, and, and could figure out, it took me years to figure out where do I go and when and why. Exactly. Yeah. You, and that's, you, you, your- you know, that's, it's, it's, I put my whole life in this exactly. thing and, and, and there's guys that there's a bunch of people out there that depend on me to bring clients to them to catch the fish. <laughs> well, I think, uh, we're going to hopefully send you some, some more people your way because this sounds really, uh, really amazing. And, you know, obviously you've been doing it for so long. This is exciting. Uh, the next, uh, I think next year is going to be cool. Hopefully we, we can pull out of COVID here. And, and did you, I guess, is that something that, um, I mean, people right now, if they listen to this in the next few months, will they be able to connect and, and do a trip with you? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know, we've got, we've got, you know, everybody is pretty much open now. We can, we can travel a lot of the places where I fish, they, you know, they were locked down for a full year yeah, and you couldn't get in or, in or out of the country, but now they're open it's and all they're open. running, they're, they're running good. Most of the stuff that I do is open. I don't, I'm not going into Mexico right now, but, 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 uh, Hawaii for the spear fish and the blue Marlin and the stripes are great. Yeah. The, uh, the, you know, Guatemala is wide open and red hot right now. Um, Costa Rica is open yep. and red hot. Huh. Um, the Dominican Republic is open and hot. You can't go to Australia. There, nobody's allowed no. in there. No, no. But Australia and New Zealand were locked out. What, what about Mexico? Why, why not Mexico? Uh, two things, crime and, and, and COVID. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just crime and COVID. Jeez. And then, uh, and then you mentioned Venezuela, I guess there's some, some political, I'm not sure what's going on there, but that's another one you'd stay away from. Yeah. I, we've been out of Venezuela now for, you know, 15 years oh, wow. since, yeah. uh, you know, you just can't, you can't, gotcha. uh, they, they, uh, the last year we were there, they were charging us eighteen dollars a gallon for fuel, and the Jeez. local base boats were th- paying twenty cents a gallon. Oh my gosh! All they, right, they just hated Americans. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jake. Hey, uh, do you want to just give a shout out in the next uh, six months or to a year? Anything new you have coming? Anything we didn't cover here? You want to give a highlight, or did we kind of touch on a little bit of everything? Sure. Yeah, that's that's good. You know, if you're happy, I'm happy. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, I think this is great. I'll, I'll send everybody over to jakejordan.com uh, or, or send your, uh, add your number there. And uh, yeah, just, just want to thank you, Jake, for uh, everything you've been doing here and, and today spending the time to clarify for me and provide this opportunity for everybody. I hope to get some people your way and, and keep connected with you. My pleasure, Dave. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we cover, just go to webflyswing.com slash 204. Uh, please subscribe to this show in your app of choice. If you're listening to an app right now, just click down, uh, click the subscribe button, and uh, this will help to assure you uh, get the next episode. And um, uh, Apple uh, actually had an update recently. Not sure if you've updated to the, re- uh, the recent software, but 
they're going to be changing their um, their term from subscribe to follow. So not sure if we're there yet, but uh, just remember that. And if you do follow and you want to get the uh, shows automatically downloaded um, directly uh, to your phone when they become live and new, uh, there's a second step. You got to click follow, and then I think click an arrow, and then make sure you subscribe um, to get updated when new shows are out. So, anyways, another step. Uh, there's a reason behind the madness. Um, so hopefully it's not too big of a deal. Uh, that's pretty much a wrap today. Uh, definitely had a fun one, Jake. Uh, I'm hoping to get out there with Jake sometime soon. And uh, and if you do, if you connect with Jake, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I want to thank you for stopping by check out the show and hope to maybe see you online or maybe on a sailfish trip. See ya. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.